Hey everybody, this is Perch, and uh, it, I haven't done one of these in a few days. So some people were saying, oh, what happened? Did Captain Marvel kill you? And the answer is yes. Yes, it did. That was a, was a tough one to do. Um, not only was it a lot of data, which is really the, the core problem, but also, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's depressing watching a company do the same thing over and over and over and have poor success. I mean, the, you know, as, as I was laying out those numbers, and it's like, oh, they're relaunching it. And it's dropping faster each time. It's 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 heading, it's losing people at a quicker and quicker rate, and none of it's doing very well. And when all the big spikes up are a result of overships and and things. And we don't talk about that nearly enough. I think in the Captain Marvel video, I appreciate a couple of people have now taken it and done some videos of their own on it, which is awesome. Tape putting their own spin on it, which is good. But the one thing I noticed people aren't talking about much is the amount of overships and incentive programs that are going into those things. Because if you take those away, and maybe that's something I need to start doing for the, the number. The problem is we don't have reliable data of what the overship number is. So I'd be completely guessing. I have some time when I was, you know, I had the shop. And I was actually getting these comics so I, I could take my number and say, well, this is probably an average of what's going on in the industry. But anyway, regardless, it was a tough one to do. It's just, it's, you don't like seeing this stuff. I, I think, I think, I think people don't get that sometimes that, you know, when you're putting something up and it's not great news, it doesn't make the person delivering. It doesn't make me happy. Like, oh, look at this. Nothing is going on. That's it's it, it wears you out, man. So we're doing a little bit of a different one. And I thought this would be a light, easy one. People were asking for Doomsday Clock, Jeff Johns, Gary Frank. Put the photos up there. I didn't realize how many people don't know what these people look like. So the yeah, there they are. There's, there's Gary Frank. Who knew? Uh, but I thought this would be a pretty fun one. But it kind of... Um, it, it I, I found the I found the glass amp empty part of <laughs> this analogy. So we're we're gonna go through it. Um, I urge you please try and stay to the to the end because there is some stuff at the end that actually sums up the the picture and it's that gut punch right at the end. So Doomsday Clock is a series that ran for twelve issues and here's the covers I picked uh, there. There's there they did a lot of variant covers. So please if somebody's saying that's ah, not the cover I like the most, I mean sure sounds sounds great. Um, the comic, uh, basically, like I mentioned, was, uh, from Jeff Johns and Gary Frank, and this was considered somewhat of a dream team coming out of Rebirth. So DC did this thing in 2017 where they, uh, and mainly it was Jeff Johns kind of with a mea culpa saying, look, uh, we, we did all this stuff in the new 52 and then we did DCU and we, we really started putting ourselves in front of what the fans and the customers were asking for. And we want to listen to you and deliver you comics that you would want. It was it was kind of this weird, rare admission that publishers can go astray and actually start to ship things that are not what the customers are asking for. And it was interesting because they did this whole pitch that was a very, I would say, fan-friendly, fan-forward way of thinking. And it was interesting to see a couple sites. I remember the Mary Sue and uh, a couple others kind of trashing that, like, oh, this is just going to empower toxic fans to ask for what they want. It's like, I mean, sure. Uh, or it's a company trying to make money. You know, one of those things. It's either, you know, toxic fans are trying to make money. There's nothing wrong with listening to your fans and saying, hey, we're publishing 52 comics a month. Why don't we have uh, some of those be fan favorites that are guaranteed to sell? I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. Yes, you, should, you can be experimental or whatever. At any rate, they do uh, Doomsday Clock a couple months after Rebirth. And it was supposed to follow up on kind of a big stinger in Rebirth, which was Batman finding the comedian's pin from Watchmen uh, in his cave. It's like, how did how did that happen? And then there was a, you know, a little bit the button story that followed up within Batman uh, shortly after. But Doomsday Clock was going to tell the story of how Dr. Manhattan manipulated and caused real problems in the DC universe. And it was also supposed to kind of kind of uh, restore some of the missing elements from the New 52. Well, it proceeded to have some pretty significant delays, and you were going to see that track uh, here. But it also, uh, you know, it, it, it did have the, what people believed, at least from this comic, was that it held its sales. And as you're going to see in this period, that's, that's sort of the case. Um, one also thing to note is when they launched Doomsday Clock in 2017, they also kind of at the same time launched Metal, 
and metal with Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's big kind of jam around uh, the dark multiverse and the Batman who laughs and all the rest of that stuff. And I believe that during the course of metal getting launched, they believed doomsday clock would be the number one attraction and metal would kind of be the, uh, the number two attraction. And it turned out that, you know, doomsday clock had a slower shipping schedule and metal turned out to print money for tie-ins and other things. And so the attention of the company seemed to, to shift from doomsday clock to metal. Uh, during the courses. But let's take a look at the sales. So as you can see here from this picture, um, it looks eh, more or less, you know, first issue bump and then a decline. But this decline is interesting. So let's go through it. Our first, first issue debuts at 283,643, a very strong number one issue. This was, you know, the Watchmen universe colliding with the DC universe. Of course, there were multiple covers. There was, you know, Gary Frank, Jeff Johns, huge team. Big number one issue, lots of sales, and it was expected that it would drop, but the drop uh, took off about 130,000, roughly 125,000 copies, which was definitely a much bigger drop from issue one to issue two than was believed would happen. And I remember that raised some huge eyebrows at DC, and given the DC politics at the time, I have no doubt that uh, Dan Didio used a little bit of this to kind of poke at Jeff Johns because that rivalry was going on. And I don't know, that there's it definitely, there was a belief at DC, and I remember people saying at the time that it was going to hold its number. So it was going to be very equivalent to Civil War where you know, you might see a 5% drop or a 10% drop at most, but generally it would hold up. But orders from retailers came in for issue two and it was down significantly. So then uh, issue three, it drops just a tiny bit to 157. Issue four goes to 149. Issue five goes to 146. Issue six at the halfway point, we're at 135. Now, you might notice something at this point. Every issue is dropping. So for an event, and particularly if we're going to hold it up and say it's like Civil War or some of the other things where the number stabilized or even went up, or even things that you know, didn't sell as much but a lower number like White Knight that actually dipped and then came back up and started selling more as readership grew, this comic, the readership atrophies issue after issue. So we get to issue 7, we're at 130. Issue 8, we're at 123. Issue 9, we're at 120. Issue 10, we're at 117, and issue 11, we're at 115. Now, I'll pause here for a moment. Every single issue, from issue 1 to issue 11, dropped. There was no stabilization. There was no growing. Now, granted, the drop was very small. But if you look at issue 2 at 158 to issue 11 at 115, we have the same creator, same uh, writer, same artist on this whole thing, heavily promoted, the Watchmen universe, the DC universe colliding, all the DC universe characters in play, a lot of the Watchmen universe characters in play. Um, it's very curious, and I'll admit being very surprised because this is not the picture that I remember hearing about at the time. Now, what I'm not showing in here are reprints, but the reprints uh, that I did gather, where there was a couple months where the reprint data wasn't there. And as soon as you're doing one of these analysis and you have a couple issues where there's no data, it throws off the entire picture. So you're better off showing nothing. So then I just become forthright of saying this was the initial order. The reprints didn't change this drop. Um, aside from, I think, issue five and issue eight is where I started to miss some data. Uh, maybe those issues were abnormally bigger than everything else. But everything else, yes, there were additional comics sold from the reprints but it was still this continual downward slope. And the reprints were not heavily significant. It was like 1,000, 500, 700. It wasn't, it wasn't big numbers. So we finally get to issue 12, and issue 12 finally breaks the curve and bumps up slightly at 2,000 more issues sold for our finale, which is also surprising because this was a big blow off the series, all mysteries revealed, what's gonna happen with uh, Dr. Manhattan's meddling, and uh, you know, finally face-to-face, -face, Dr. Manhattan and Superman are gonna collide and it bumped up 2,000 issues to 117. We went from 283,000 down to 117. That's curious. Again, not what you'd expect. Now, it goes without saying, this entire series uh, all held above 100,000 copies, and you cannot, you cannot scoff at that. That's, that's great news. I mean, 100,000 copies for 12 issues? Sure, lots of comics would kill for that. Marvel would, and probably has, killed uh, for that. <laughs> But overall, you know, in terms of our sales stats, yeah, number one was the highest selling issue at 283. Number 11 was the lowest selling with 115. And the average issue sales across the whole series was 142,000, just average everything out, which is, of course, heavily bumped up by that first issue.
okay, a success. All in all, a success. But this starts to tell some interesting pictures. So first off, let's look at the trend. So the trend goes from 280 down to 114. And this is basically a 59% trend decrease from issue one to issue 12. But that first issue, of course, like, like almost always, it did oversell, it did be good. So let's let's take that first issue out and let's look for issue two through issue 12. There we go from 158 to 114. And we get a 28% trend decrease, almost 30%. Now, what is this? This is average. DC is typically 25 to 30% trend decrease uh, across everything. That's That's kind of you know, in general, what you see across a lot of the different creators. Um, interesting. Uh, this was a highly promoted kind of two of arguably the best creators in the company or, or definitely at the top. And you're still seeing a 28% decrease from issue two to issue 12. That's curious. Um, what else does this tell us? Well, first of all, going back to this picture again, um, you saw it at the beginning. Let's talk about it a little bit more. This was when the comic shipped. So it started in November of 2017. It ends in December of 2019, kind of a two years and change later. And what's curious is this comic, when it was originally billed, said it was going to be monthly, and then they quickly said it was going to be every other month. And then weirdly, it didn't ship every other month. The first three issues shipped monthly, and then it went into bi-monthly for a little while, and then it skipped a couple issues, went to you know, quarterly, and then back to bi-monthly, and then you know, then it, it had four months in between issues uh, 10 and 11, and then it, it had a, a somewhat erratic shipping schedule. Now, that doesn't seem to have impacted the sales. The sales were a constant decrease, but you don't see, like, increased drops when there's a delay. While it was out, um, it was a number one comic, and, and here's where, hopefully you're still with me at this point, this is coming up on the, the important thing to think about. This comic was the number one comic for the first three issues, issue one through three. This was when metal was going on. And then it slipped to the number two comic, the number three comic, four. Um, it was an issue, it finally, its lowest point was, was it was the seventh best-selling comic in September of 2019 for issue 11, then back to number one for December of 2019. And in case you're curious, I put up on the screen right here, the months that it wasn't number one, this was the comic that was. We had metal, uh, there we had uh, The Amazing Spider-Man. I think this was 800, 700 or 800. I don't recall now. This is The Batman Wedding, Return of Wolverine, number one, Batman Who Laughs, Deceased. Uh, and there's Detective Comics Anniversary Issue and Spawn 300. These were the number one comics during that month. But what's the picture that, that, uh, that, that you know, what's the picture that you think I'm trying to say here? Um, the comic industry between November of 2017 and December of 2019 to be a number one comic in November of 2017, to be the number one, you were selling, you know, basically 283,000 copies. That, that got you number one. To be the number one comic in December of 2019, you only had to sell 117,000 copies. Now, this is an interesting point. It means that the number one comic for, for November of 2017 sold twice as much and more two years later. Um, it, 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 there's an interesting story here about what's going on here with the comic industry. As Doomsday Clock slid in sales, so too did what the number one comic was slid. This is kind of a tricky point to, to establish, but it basically means that what it took to be the best-selling comic of the month decreased. It got to be an easier bar, which in this case is bad news for the comic industry. More comics were sold, certainly. There was a lot more, but it basically what happened is the uh, the middle, the comics that were coming in between, I don't know, 30,000 and 60,000, more comics fell into there. And as the comic publishers started publishing more comics during that time period, the overall dollars in the industry probably rose from 2017 to 2019. But a single title selling big numbers changed significantly. I mean, if you look at what it took to be number one in those first three months, and then how it wound up toward the end, where in May of 2019, Doomsday Clock was the number two book. Number one was Deceased, which sold great. But in general, the whole ceiling dropped. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's when you really let that sink in, it's a bit chilling what, what it actually took place. So some key takeaways, as I mentioned, with the exception of the final issue, 
every issue declined in sales. That's you know uh, not unusual for an ongoing, but a little bit unusual for a big event title as hyped as much as it was. As I mentioned, the long delays didn't noticeably hurt the sales beyond expected declines. Now, you might argue maybe if it was coming out on time, it would have flattened out. It's hard to paint that picture because this decline was so slow and steady. It's the steady part that makes me think, no, the, the actual the delays didn't really do much. The number one title sales dropped during this time period, as I mentioned. DC did own nine of the 12 number one spots. Uh, that, that's also interesting. It means DC was going for more. You had the anniversary issue in there. You had metal. You had a bunch of limited series um, going. In fact, of that picture, when you're looking at the number one comics there, um, the only ones, you had Amazing Spider-Man and you had Batman, this wedding issue, and everything else, and Spawn. Sorry, how could I forget Spawn? Everything else was a limited series or an anniversary issue or some kind of event. You know, Return of Wolverine, The Batman Who Laughs, the, uh, the Detective Comics Anniversary Issue, Doomsday Clock itself. Everything else was an event. That's also interesting of how things have changed in comics, if you remember back when they, I did that Hush video. The last bit, trade sales. So here's here's an interesting bit, because we, start, we stopped getting good, reliable information because the numbers stopped coming in consistently in March of 2020, thanks to the pandemic and then DC opting out of Diamond. But the numbers we do have are noticeably lower coming from Diamond than they were in Amazon. Now, it's a little bit tricky to understand what that means, but it may indicate that graphic novels and those kinds of sales have a healthier life over in Amazon than they do in a comic shop. That's, that's just a, that's an interesting theory that's going to have to be borne out with some more of these analyses. But there you go. That's Doomsday Clock. You were asking for it. There you have it. Uh, 12 issues, um, some interesting takeaways. Again, not the picture I thought I was going to get when I got into this, but there you go. That's how it works out sometimes. Hey, what's coming up? Well, I've got House of X Powers of Tin, I think, coming up next. And then, um, God, what else What else am I doing? I'll have to I'll have to look at the old spreadsheet to see what's uh, what's coming up. Oh, we have metal. Yeah, we'll, we'll compare metal, and then we'll compare metal to the two of them and, you know, see how all that looked. Um, that, that'll be fun. Uh, the first metal series didn't, didn't, I mean, it did well, but um, probably again, not, not quite what you would expect. The picture looks a lot closer to Doomsday Clock than you might think. Um, yeah, it's, it's worth noting that the time metal beat Doomsday Clock, uh, it was actually quite close. Um, it was not, uh, they, they, it wasn't uh, far away between the two. Uh, when that was going on. So that, that's also interesting. Anyway, I um, hope, hope you, this was good. Let me know your comments, your questions below. Let me know the comics you want me to do. I'm happy to do those as well. I'm doing, oh yes, uh, yes, I'm doing Aquaman by Kelly Sue DeConnick, which I know people are just chomping at the bit to see that very, very low impact <laughs> sales analysis. There you have it. Uh, we'll keep doing this. Ask your questions, like, subscribe, Recommend to a friend. Um, as always, you're welcome to use whatever you want out of this video. It's all yours. Have fun. Thanks for listening and watching.